It was great to catch up with our dear friend Trent Dilfer as he takes on this new challenge. He's done it all, uh, obviously playing 14 years in the NFL, head coach of Elite 11 for 12 years. Uh, at Lipscomb Academy, but now you can you can feel the excitement in his voice as he takes over at UAB, and so excited to see how they do starting off this fall. Lots of great info in this one. We hope you enjoy. Trent, welcome to the Elite Eleven podcast. Uh, before we get going, I just want to give our our listeners a, a quick rundown of your resume in case they aren't familiar. Uh, you are a husband, a father, a 14-year NFL veteran, a Super Bowl champion. You were the head coach of the Elite 11 from 2011 to 2022. You're an ESPN NFL analyst and Monday Night Football broadcaster. You're a two-time state champion head high school football coach at Lipscomb Academy in Nashville, Tennessee. You're the new head football coach at UAB. And, and per our crack uh, research staff, which is which is me, uh, you're the first quarterback ever to be a top 10 pick in the NFL draft, start for a Super Bowl champion, and become an FBS head football coach. Uh, is there anything we missed? I'm a new grandfather, too. That's probably the best part of my resume right now, B, is uh, seven months ago, I became a granddad, and it's better than all that stuff. It's amazing, and it's a great resume. Uh, I want to jump in because I know your time is, is precious and start off really with the timely football topic, you know, coming off of the Super Bowl. Um, and the Super Bowl, as usual, is all about the quarterbacks, right? Uh, two guys that just had amazing years and went toe-to-toe uh, in terms of Patrick Mahomes and Jalen Hurts. Uh, but want to get your thoughts specifically on Jalen Hurts. Uh, we got a chance to see Jalen a ton in high school, you know, through the Elite 11 process, Elite 11 finals in 2015. Uh, and then back as a college counselor in 2018 and 2019. Uh, what qualities did you see in Jalen throughout that, you know, Elite 11 process and journey that you think have been difference makers for him in terms of just, you know, how he's been able to navigate and battle through all the adversity he's faced throughout his journey and, and now really emerge, you know, especially through this past season as one of the top quarterbacks in all of the NFL? Yeah, I, I love Jalen's story, his journey, um, everything about it. I thought uh, Greg Olson did a great job early in the game talking about what a model for getting through adversity and showing grit and resilience, uh, how your journey as a quarterback doesn't always look the way you want it to. Um, but some of those tough moments are the things that make you great. And You know, when you're talking about Jalen in the lead 11, I think I learned a lot um, from his journey. And, and the biggest thing is he's got the right stuff. Uh, people talk so often about traits, and yes, they're very important. Uh, production, yes, very important. Systems you play in, important. But I don't think any of it's more important than having the right stuff. And what I mean by that is that the soul that you um, play with, uh, your grit, your resilience, your mental and physical toughness, your leadership qualities, um, you know, all those things that go in to allowing you to play football a long time. And, and Jalen, even at a young age, uh, had all that, you know, son of a great coach, uh, brought up the right way, uh, a leader of amongst leaders. Uh, although he was raw when we had him, uh, he definitely had the stuff. And then the other thing is he had the horsepower. You know, he just had that natural juice in his body. It showed more as a runner in his younger days, but as he got coached well through his journey, um, you start you start seeing that horsepower refined into consistency and. And it just, I think it can teach everybody that as a young player, if they have the right stuff, they have enough horsepower with the correct nurturing, um, they can improve on a lot of the things that maybe were deficiencies at a young age can actually become efficiencies as they get older. Uh, I, the biggest thing about Jalen that stood out was I watched some old Elite 11 stuff and he was locking that front leg, you know, that front left leg would just snap every time he threw it and his chest would get over his feet and the release point would change and it added to a lot of inconsistencies, but to his credit, the coaches in his life, you know, over the years, he recognized that he went to work fixing it uh, and he's become a beautiful throw of the football as well as a dynamic runner, dynamic leader, uh, tough guy, you know, and obviously one of the more productive players in the league. No, great points on Jalen. And, and I think you're, you're especially right on as it relates to the amount of development that can still come, you know, through these kids. We see him at 17, 18 years old and, I think the recruiting process, there's these expectations that these guys are supposed to be finished products. And, and Jalen's just such a great example of, you know, how a kid 
takes you know some perceived weaknesses and things he needs to work on and, and really through his work ethic and, and just dedication to his craft have, have made him into strengths and he continues to evolve and improve each year as a, as a player and a quarterback and as a leader um, and also great segue you know let, let's get right into it as it relates to you know elite 11 and and the great you know 12 years that that we got to spend with you as our head coach um i think let's maybe just start with with your recollection and um, you know, recall of, of, you know, how that came to be and, and how we were put together in, you know, I think late 2010, early 2011, and, and you started off your tenure uh, in 2011 as the, as the head coach of Elite 11. Yeah, I mean, I had heard about Elite 11 and obviously had a great reputation. You guys did an incredible job going back to Andy, Andy's vision of this, uh, Bob, you, you know, everybody being involved. Um, it, it was an incredible camp. Uh, and I remember going out to one of the regionals. I believe I went out with Alex Smith, if I can remember correctly, and at Stanford, yeah, and wa- watching the flow of it and um, watching the talent there, uh, watching the type of coaches getting after it and just being like, wow, this is this is pretty cool. This is more than a camp. And uh, really, you know, at that time, my, I, was, I was transitioning from the NFL to TV, was very passionate about trying to find a way to kind of bring the quarterback community together I was very fractured at the time from a training standpoint, from a development standpoint. There were so many narratives out there about coaching. And um, I just saw it as a, as a neat opportunity to try to bring people together and, and try to create a common um, theme for quarterback training, a common nomenclature that would benefit everybody, coach, player, uh, the youth players. Uh, and I'm looking at this going, wow, this thing is so impactful. Uh, it reaches so many uh, this would be a great opportunity to kind of, you know, beta test if that's even possible. Yeah, I remember that Stanford camp well and Alex Smith. and I think Jerry Rice actually was out there, too, and, and had some cleats in his backpack and threw them on and dusted a couple high school corners with with the, his old post corner. But, um, yeah, I mean, going back to that point, was was coaching even something that was, you know, in your mind as something you wanted to do or, you know, whether consciously or deep down? I know you had started kind of on the broadcasting journey, right, with with a little bit with NFL Network and then with ESPN, but but where was coaching as it relates to you know a passion or you know even something that that you were looking to do at that point? Yeah, that's uh, I'll try to keep this quick. <laughs> you know, my wife always thought I would coach, and I resisted at every opportunity because I had girls, and I just didn't want to have the three girls around that locker room environment. And frankly, I'd only seen a handful of of coaches in my football life that had daughters be great coaches and be great dads to daughters. And I was scared to death of jeopardizing that ability to be a great dad of daughters. And, um, and then this elite 11 thing kind of was like, Oh, and I remember vividly talking to my wife, I, I could tell you where we were at the house when we kind of agreed that I was going to do this. That was like, you know, I think this will feed the coaching uh, fix. Like this will give me enough in the coaching space where I can still be dad. I can still be, you know, I still do the TV thing. Uh, yet feel like I'm having an impact from a coaching standpoint. It really did. I, I, that was a true statement early on that um, it fed that piece of me that needed to coach, that wanted to be around community, that wanted to be around the football community, that wanted to impact young men, uh, help build, you know, help feed coaches and build into them. And um, man, and for many years, uh, I didn't really have a, a craving to traditionally coach uh, because the Elite 11 – uh, piece was was quenching that thirst to do so. Always love quenching the thirst, and I think that's been a, a great thing throughout the history of our events. It's an opportunity for guys that that maybe don't have the full calendar year to 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 delve into coaching, but you know it's a great place for them to be an outlet. And there's so many guys that know so much ball um, that we've we've always tried to get the best of the best of the quarterback minds out to work with Elite Eleven, and and you were obviously a huge part of that. So I mean, you kind of you kind of mentioned it and started getting to it. You know what what growth did you see kind of within yourself, you know, starting in 2011, going through that Elite 11 uh, coaching tenure to where you get to 2018, 2019, um, and this opportunity comes about at Lipscomb Academy to, to potentially transition into high school football, and how did that kind of thought process go for you? Well, I think what ultimately happened, Brian, is a compliment to everybody was, you know, the team we put together, and it's truly a we thing, um, student sports under your leadership, uh, myself, Joey, uh, all the coaches around the country, all the support staff, we, we built something that was really a holistic model. Was, uh, it, it was obviously doing best-in-class football, um, but never losing sight that we were trying to give them tools 
to grow as humans. And it was so successful. You, you saw the football piece be so much stickier uh, when the headliner was about human development. And I started, it was twofold. One, I started wondering if this is truly the way to coach. Like what if every team was coached this way where the headliner was human development and the byproduct of that was better football. And I wanted a different stage to test that on instead of a camp setting, instead of just quarterbacks and maybe touching on it briefly with the opening. Um, could you do this with an entire football team and you know how successful could it be? And about the same time, and this is again a compliment to everybody, you know, I was not going to as many regionals. In fact, I was only going to what, one or two a year. And I would step out there and I would just be in awe of what a well-oiled machine it was. And I would joke that, yes, I was quote unquote the head coach, but I was probably the least important person when it came to Elite 11. Like I would step out there and be like, they don't need me. Like I, I'm the least important person out here. And as those two things were happening, uh, I was also transitioning in life. I was becoming an empty nester. Uh, the issue with the with the girls being around the football life wasn't as paramount anymore. Um, and it truly, I, I felt like it was a calling. It was a calling to try something uh, in a different setting. I never in a million years thought it was going to be high school football. Uh, you know, I had all these inquiries and opportunities at, at the pro and college level for all those years that I had turned down. I figured just naturally going to the college game or the pro game. Um, but ended up going to the high school game and it was the perfect way to test this theory, which was, um, what I call now the bucket theory, which is if you pour into the human bucket enough and it starts to overflow, it's going to overflow into great football. And I believe we proved that at Lipscomb, you know, we got there, there was 38 kids on the team, six lifted with PVC pipes. They couldn't tackle. They couldn't throw. They couldn't catch. They couldn't even get into stance. Uh, they're the 3,000th ranked team in the country. And four years later, we're a top 15 team in the country, uh, multiple power five and group of five players, uh, multiple state champions, undefeated season. Um, but more importantly, a lot of really good kids, um, kids that were impacting their communities in a positive way, um, academically improving uh, daily, um, you know, just values, value adds outside of football you know, better humans. And he talked to a lot of them, especially that last year at Lipscomb last year, so many of them pointed to that. So many pointed to them as they changed their habits off the field, they became better players, decision makers, teammates on the field. Uh, and everything that we had seen happen with Elite 11 for all those years, this holistic uh, development philosophy, uh, it really does work. And, um, I'll segue myself, but that's kind of what made me say, okay, well, if we could do it in a camp setting, we could do it in a high school setting. Who's to say we can't do it in a college football setting? Yeah, it's great that you're setting me up to go to UAB, but I'd really like to take a step back and, and go back to that, that transition and that move to Lipscomb. And, you know, what was your, what was your feeling going into that? How, how prepared did you really feel as you're, as you're trying to take what we were doing at Elite 11 and we get, you know, we get four or five days with the top quarterbacks each year at the finals and, you know, this really cool program that, that you and Joey and myself helped set. And you're, you're going to take that to a high school football team, you know, 24-7, 365, and, and try to apply it to a program of, you know, 80 to 100 kids. What was your level of preparedness for that? You know, what were those first couple of days like? And, and, and who were some, you know, key mentors or, you know, folks from your football past that you, you really tried to lean on as it relates to, to getting ready to make that move and, and feeling like you were as buttoned up as you could be, you know, going into a, obviously a totally new experience there taking on that job at, at Liscom Academy? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I, a lot of the principles that went with the Elite 11 um, growth applied to the building of a program. Um, you're coaching coaches, right? Uh, you have to be highly organized. You got to have a vision. Um, you got to create a mission that points towards that vision. Uh, you have to um, rally people to get them all going the same direction, right? That's one of the greatest. And people always say, what's leadership? I'm like getting people to go in the same direction. Like you got to get everybody going the, the same way. Um, those, all those principles carried over. I, I think I became a much better um Organizers, kind of a dumbed down term for it, but a planner, 
with Elite 11 and became a, a very detailed planner uh, building that program. Uh, I think awareness is a big thing. I think anytime, you know, what, what we did together, what so many of us did with Elite 11 was we took this really cool camp and turned it into kind of a, a cult-ish following, right? Like it became a community of people around the country because the awareness around it, whether it was social media, or was that was messaging, the, the documentaries, and all the different things uh, that you guys did at Student Sports to, um, you know, enhance the narrative of Elite 11, become make it more, uh, a greater awareness around it, applied to the build at Lipscomb. We had to create an awareness of what was going on and use those channels uh, to do so appropriately. Uh, to answer your question about influences, I had so many. You know, I'm the son of a football, uh, high school football coach. I actually leaned on my, my stepdad, Frank, a lot. Um, even though it was, you know, a hundred years ago, as he would say, it's still the same principles of, of getting people together and getting them to, um, work towards a common, a common vision. Um, you know, I, I reached out to some of my college friends that coached high school football. Uh, Chip Kelly actually was very, um, influential in both my decision to take the Lipscomb job, but also kind of his uh, advice on how to do some things. I leaned on some older guys, Bill Parcells, actually. I uh, leaned on him a little bit, although he was a pro guy. He really appreciates the high school game and and really is about development. Like, you know, what where are your what are your bedrocks? What are your starting points when you're developing people? Uh, I talked to some people in the coaching community in Texas where I'd lived for a couple of years, some of the best high school football in the country, kind of talked to them. And, you know, Tom Dodge at Westlake was able to spend some time with him and uh, multiple guys around the country, guys out on the tour, right? Guys on the Elite 11 tour and the opening tour had been high school coaches and uh, leaned on them, uh, but just kind of gathered information. But the one thing I, I, I was steadfast on was I wasn't going to do somebody else's model, uh, that I would take all this, imp all this information, all the input and advice and kind of consolidate it and filter it and, and say, okay, what fits for this? Because we're going to do it a little bit differently. So why would I do something somebody else's way when I always planned on doing it a different way with my first crack at it? So some of it was just figuring it out. I mean, you've heard me say this. I think one of the greatest qualities a coach can have is figured outness. Um, and a lot of it we figured out on the fly. You know, we tried one thing. It maybe wasn't ideal. And then we pivoted. Uh, I was willing to recognize when I was wrong at something and, and started a bad process and immediately uh, put it in the trash can and develop a new process. And and then when we had a really good process going, how do you make it better? I remember when Sione came and joined us in year two. You know, he's a two-time head coach in California, a really successful one. And I had him come in and vet all of our drills and all of our schedules and all of our pra practice plans and off-season conditioning and all the different elements of the 365 program. And he probably adjusted, I don't know, 30% of it uh, and made it better, Um and I think you have to be willing as a leader to, to constantly have a growth mindset and surround yourself with people that uh, are better than you in certain areas and can help make your, your program better. No, it's been amazing to follow what you guys have done from a distance at, at Lipscomb and, uh, you know, taking that, that really pouring into the player and, and the football kind of takes, <clears throat> takes care of itself you know, when you do right by the kid and, and, the, and the program and the families that, that are part of your program as well. So, I mean, now we now we got the next chapter at UAB and, and you know, one, like you said, it's exciting to see how that's going to transition to the college level. But let's rewind a little bit and just just go back, you know, to how this job kind of came to be. And, you know, did you have outbound into the into the kind of coaching space where you're looking to move up? I know and you guys have, have been really successful, especially the last two years. And so, you know, when you're putting up 70 points and playoff games and things like that, you start looking for the next challenge uh, kind of regardless. But then, you know, two, why UAB, right? Uh, there's 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 so many jobs, you know, and they open every year and things like that. And, and as you were looking around in the coaching space, you know, what was attractive about about the UAB position? So. I'd be lying to say that it wasn't out like in the corner of my mind, but that's really all it was. It was this tiny little corner that every once in a while would think, you know, we can do this a lot of places. You know, this model works. Uh, the people I've surrounded myself are the best at doing this. And, um, you know, this could be a business in a box for lack of a better term. You know, like you really could take this model and take it pretty much anywhere and it's going to be impactful. Uh, but that was just a tiny little piece. 
I was being pursued. It has happened the last three years where I don't have an agent, but my lawyer would get these calls gauging my interest of going to the next level. And three years ago, it was very minimal. Uh, last year, it was a little more aggressive, had a couple opportunities. And then this year, it was becoming, especially in the Southeast, was becoming, um, I don't want to say relentless, that'd be an exaggeration, but constant. And my wife and I were sitting down uh, on the couch one night, kind of talking through all this stuff. And, and I was like, you know, I think we're good. I, I feel like, yes, we've accomplished everything we want to accomplish, but there's still some layers of things I want to do in the high school space. Uh, and I'm content. You know, I feel good about the community we're in. Uh, I'm not an ambitious guy at this stage of my football career. Um, I'm competitive. Don't mistake not being ambitious for not being competitive. But I really wasn't looking to jump for any selfish reasons. And she looked at me and she just goes, you know, I disagree. She goes, you were made for more than this. And this is not taking away anything from Lipscomb, but um, you were made to, to keep doing this at, at different levels and having more impact. And her argument was, no matter how much this model changes a community, that community at Lipscomb in Middle Tennessee it's not as impactful as changing, changing a huge institution or maybe a region uh, or maybe setting a new model on, on a, a player first philosophy and coaching, not a win first at all costs mentality and this human development piece. And I mean, it wasn't, it was a very short time after that that Mark Ingram, the AD at UAB, um, really started going down this road with me and more aggressively than the other schools. Uh, lots of meetings, lots of Zooms, lots of in-persons, uh, really just selling me on the opportunity here at UAB. And um, the more I kind of went down that road, I kind of felt for a while like I was cheating on Lipscomb, um, but I wasn't. You know, I was doing it after hours. I made a, I remember telling Joey one morning when I first told him, like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explore this a little bit, but don't you dare let me cheat one second from these kids or this community. And I didn't. Uh, they were long hours, but I think we finished stronger than we even started at Lipscomb. We played our best football the last three weeks of my career there. Uh, in fact, I would say this, our state game was the closest to perfect football I'd ever seen um, played. And I'm super proud of our staff and the kids for playing the very best game they'd ever played. I would argue one of the best games you can play as a high school team in, in the final game of the season when it mattered the most. And then I was doing this after hours. So a lot of 7.30 to 1 o'clock in the morning, spreadsheets and vision casting and mission work and exploration, talking to coaches, building the staff, you know, all these different things were going on late late in the evening until we kind of came to terms, I would say, I don't know, seven, ten days before the state championship game. And uh, then it was just a hold on, white knuckle hold on so it doesn't get re uh, announced because we thought there'd be a lot of shrapnel if that happened. And uh, at the time when it when it was announced the night before the state game, it was a scary thing or two nights before it was a scary thing. And I was really concerned that it would take away from uh, our ability to play, play our best and, and finish something strong. And, and it actually was the opposite of that. I think, you know, those last two days actually brought us closer together. And uh, I think people understood. I think they were appreciative of what we as a staff had done for them and their community. Um, that we had finished well, uh, that we had done all the things we set out to do. And uh, overall, the feeling I got towards the end was a freedom to launch. It wasn't kind of shackles to stay. It was a freedom to launch. And, and that was affirmation that we had gone through the process well and, and treated people well uh, as we were transitioning to another venture. Yeah, that transition had to be tough, I think, especially right anytime you're dealing with high school kids and, and parents and, and they grow so attached to you and, and what you guys did down there. But it's also, I think, just a, such a testament to what you guys did, you know, and, and the kids that you built and poured into and your coaching staff that you guys were able to finish so strong the way you were, you know, even as this news of you heading to UAB, you know, trickled out a couple of days before the game and things like that. And so um, I'll transition a little bit. I know you've done all the introductory press conferences and that sort of stuff already. And you're, you're a little over two months there on the job now, right, um, at UAB. But what are you most excited about, you know, as, as you've moved into this role? And, and what, gets you, what gets you fired up to, to get in the office every morning and, and roll up your sleeves and, and get to work on, on the, everything you're working on down there? You know, it's really not that different um, in the sense of what excites me, the kids and the coaches. 
um, the relationships. I've been really, really fortunate, um, humbled by the, the quality of staff we've been able to hire. Um, those that came with me from Lipscomb uh, in different roles, but, you know, coaches and people that we spent a lot of time developing over the years, uh, they're just hitting their stride. You know, their fastball's heating up to like 92, 93 now. So to see them jump into something else and just be prepared for it, uh, not overwhelmed, has been fun. Uh, the coaches we've been able to hire from around the country, you know, colleges like Ohio State and Alabama and South Carolina, and I then go on and on and on of, of these seasoned coaches that have coached the highest level of college football um, that were jumping at the opportunity to come um, be part of the staff. Uh, we have veteran coaches, uh, ex-head coaches, guys that coached me in the NFL that uh, were fired up about uh, doing this with me, um, veteran coaches that have been associate head coaches at other places that, that wanted to take a new role and, and do this with us. So that gets me really excited. It's a big staff. You know, we did a different model. Usually the group of five staffs are uh, smaller. You're trying to make your money. You're trying to get the budgets be directed to a small amount of people. We did it different here. We have a massive staff, um, kind of more of that power five model with a lot of analysts, a lot of QC people, a lot of support staff uh, assisting the, the position coaches, uh, tr trying to create a real professional feel in the building and, and watching all these pieces come together. 45 uh, staffers we've hired in two months and, and watching them every day come to work and, and learn how to work uh, with each other and uh, learn to work on mission for this vision that we've casted. It, has really been exciting. I think that's the thing that gets me to jump out of bed every morning. And and then these kids, you know, I, Bill Clark did an incredible job building this program uh, from the dirt after it was shut down. And then Bryant Vince at the interim last year did a really good job in a really tough situation of creating a, a camaraderie amongst these players. And they did a good job recruiting. I, we have some really talented players. We have length, uh, we have strength, we have size, we have movement abilities. Uh, we have skilled guys um, like the cupboard was not dry by any stretch of the imagination. So it's a little bit different. Um, I would call this a remodel instead of a rebuild uh, where Lipscomb was a rebuild. This is a remodel. And um, so it excites me to get to know these players. I mean, it's amazing. The, the biggest difference between high school and college leadership is the recruiting aspect, you know. I know people said we recruited at Lipscomb, but we really didn't. <laughs> it's called admissions in high school. In high school, you're just trying to get kids to go through the admissions process. You're truly recruiting here in college football, and it's the lifeblood of your program. Well, that's easy to say, but what for, what you forget there is if you're so focused on recruiting the next um, wave of players, you forget about the players that are on your roster. So we tried really hard to make sure in the midst of recruiting – that we were nurturing the players on the roster and getting to know them. And that that's probably the hardest thing. If people ask me what's been the hardest challenge is establishing relationships with people that are here, that are already members of UAB Blazer football, uh, while at the same time going out and doing another class, whether that be you know 23s that are freshmen, whether that be portal kids, JC kids, mid-years, May, you know, whatever it is, you're really playing this balancing act of uh, refreshing your roster, but also nurturing the roster that you have. I think that's the one that I maybe was not prepared for in the sense I didn't recognize the challenge there. Um, so that's been quite the challenge. I think we've done a good job. But like I told our players that were here, I said, you know, my first team meeting I had with them, I said, first of all, you have zero reason to trust me. Don't trust. Don't ever just trust a title. Uh, trust the per learn to trust the people with the title if they earn your trust. And so we've called this period earn it. Like we as coaches, myself specifically, is trying to earn their trust. Uh, and that's a daily challenge. Um, so that's really been our focus, uh, especially now that we've kind of closed out that last piece of recruiting of making sure that these players that are here um, every day see us try to earn their trust with how we treat them how we provide for them, uh, how we nurture them, how we hold them accountable. You know, I've talked about this for years uh, when I'm speaking is, you know, you have to have this love accountability scale and you know, this is a parent, you're a great dad, but you know, that accountability, accountability gets higher than love and you're a tyrant. 
that love gets higher than accountability and you're just kumbaya on your enable you're an enabler so constantly trying to balance out that hey we love you but we're going to hold you equally accountable uh, i think they're really appreciating that perspective and and daily myself and the rest of this massive staff uh is going to work at trying to earn this group's trust so that you know, when we actually have to play a football game. It's more than just X's and O's and talent. Um, there's a soul to this team. And I think that soul is really built on trust. Oh, that's amazing. I mean, I was a, I was a program guy in college, you know, a special teamer before I got hurt, that sort of stuff. So I, I love pouring into every player on your roster and getting everything you can out of those, those 85 scholarship guys, right? I think that's how you have the strongest program is, is your, your, your bottom portion of the roster is is the most fired up to be there and they know their roles and, and they're doing all they can to to play a, a meaningful role within the program. So, uh, but the question I have now is, is so how do you balance that part? And your philosophy has always been, you know, to invest into the people with what is now, you know, the hot topic in college football, you know, the opportunity to acquire talent through the transfer portal. So you have, you have this roster of 85 and you're loving them. And, but at the same time, you have this, this new avenue to go out and acquire additional talent. So how do you, how do you balance those two? Is there, is there a priority or a way you guys look at it to, you know, try to continue to lean in on the, on the kids you currently have in the program, but at the same time, you know, keep your finger on the pulse to, to ways to improve uh, through the transfer portal. So the simple answer is honesty and transparency. I, I think your whole roster needs to understand that football is a meritocracy and it's a great life lesson too, because, um, you know, the strongest survive, the most productive thrive, yada, yada, yada. However, that doesn't mean you're, you're less valuable than somebody that is thriving and producing. It doesn't mean you're less valuable as a person um, because somebody maybe with more talent is coming in. Uh, and I, I think being honest with these players uh, from jump and just being like, guys, we're, we're every year we're going to try to out recruit our roster. Uh, we're trying to bring in more talented players. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to play. You know, talent doesn't necessarily mean they're going to take your spot. Um, but just being honest, like that is our goal as a staff. Now, those of you that are here, we're going to be completely honest with where you stand at all times and, and have these open conversations about uh, your abilities and your development. But know that in the midst of all of that, you guys matter the same as humans. Whether you're, say, we get some five-star freak that comes here and you know has every offer in the world and he, he wants to come to Birmingham and play for us, he's no more important than the 120th guy on the roster as a human being. And that's one thing to say it, but you actually have to do it. And I think that is the, the that that has been our secret sauce relationally since we started doing this at Elite 11, Lipscomb and now here, is proving that to them. So, you know, when you have the walk-on free safety come into your office, want to set office hours with you, um, you accept it and you sit down and you have a conversation with that kid and, and you get to know him and make him make him understand that you value him as a human being and, and be clear with your expectations for him and, and what some of the possible scenarios are uh, with his ability to be part of this roster. And I, I can't tell you how many kids have just thanked me for being honest with them. Uh, sometimes the truth hurts um, and they'll say, you know, this is not what I wanted to hear, but I appreciate you telling me. Um, and then uh, that established kind of this communication opportunity with this young person establishes a relationship. And it's amazing now, just two months in, how many of these guys I feel like I've known for, you know, five, six, seven years because we've established a relationship with them. So, uh, I would say that's the easiest answer that, you know, they're reading on social media, they're reading in the papers. Oh, they just signed an outside linebacker. And if you're sitting there as an outside linebacker going, wait a second, there's already nine of us. <laughs> this job just got a lot harder. Well, we want them to embrace that. We want them to embrace the challenge of what it is to be a college football athlete, but at the same time, balance that challenge that they're facing with, hey, there's a group of dudes in this building. They're called coaches, but they actually care about me. They're checking on whether I go to class as well as the as the big top recruit going to class. They care about how I'm doing the little things out on the practice field like they do the top recruit. Man, they coach me as hard in the weight room as they coach the big time recruit. And I don't think you'd find a guy on this roster to this point that would say they feel neglected from a coaching standpoint. I mean, we're, we're riding them as hard in a good way about the details of what they're doing football wise and off the field, as much as we are the new, the mid-year recruits we brought in. So uh, I think a lot of young people just want to be their best. 
and they're looking for people that in their lives are going to help them be their best. Now, their circumstances, yes, they care about their circumstances, and sometimes it hurts when their circumstances aren't as positive as they thought they were going to be. However, I think deep down, they can appreciate that, hey, I don't like that this guy has me as a seventh outside linebacker, but I sure appreciate the fact that he coaches me like the guy on the top of the depth chart. No, love it. Serve, grow, launch. I think that will play in recruiting, obviously. And, you know, it, the the quarterback development you guys should have in your program with the staff, I think there's the opportunity, like you said, to to grow your backups and invest into them. And if they get a chance to transfer out somewhere else, that, that hopefully just serves you guys as it relates to, you know, the next group of quarterbacks that you want to get into that room and and continue to grow them. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll play off of that a little bit. The quarterback position specifically, obviously you have a wealth of background and knowledge, your playing career let alone, but but you also probably have the most unique perspective on uh, the elite high school quarterback and the college quarterback from the last 12 years with Elite 11, where you've got a chance to see all those top high school guys each year at the finals and then also interact with current college quarterbacks as counselors. So how does that play into you know what you guys will evaluate and place value on as you recruit the quarterback position? You know, Will you have a little bit of maybe a, a different or non-traditional process based on you know, just your, your vast history and um, knowledge and different viewpoints of, of the quarterbacks as they come through their, their recruiting process and stages of development versus, you know, the, the traditional programs and, and how they look at that quarterback position. Yeah. You know, I think we're going to grow into that. Um, we're, we're shaping that right now as a staff, especially, you know, Alex Mortensen, my offense coordinator, Nick Coleman, my quarterback coach, and myself in the recruiting department, you know, identifying the things that we value the most. Um, the one thing we won't value the most is what other people think about them. And, and I'm not trying to knock anybody. I'm just saying, you know, like you have to be convicted on what you value the most. Um, I think they have to have enough horsepower, right? I really, I'll go back to that term. Like you have to have enough of the stuff that's going to allow you to do a lot of things in the quarterback position. The positions change. You can't just be a thrower anymore. You can't just be a pocket guy anymore. You got to have some movement qualities. Um, you got to be able to play the game uh, off schedule, off off platform. Um, you know, but you still have to have those innate quarterback abilities, uh, the ability to throw the ball accurately, the ability to process information. I think there's a toughness mentally and physically that you need to have to play this game at a high level. Uh, but, but, you know, we're trying to figure out our formula of what that is. Um, you know, I, I think there's the eye in the sky doesn't lie, <laughs> you know, and camps are important. They're super important. And you want to see how they do in a camp environment because it's competitive with other peers, uh, their, their peers. It's competitive, especially when they're challenged. Like in an Elite 11 camp, you're going to be challenged to do more things. You're going to be challenged to do at other camps. So you get to see kind of their their threshold uh, of the things they can adapt to. But at the end of the day, you want to watch the tape and we won't watch full games. You're just watching highlight films. You know, I think, you know, you get a, you get a feel for the highlight film. That should be their absolute best. Uh, that should be their ceiling, so to speak, uh, at this age. But you want to, you also want to see their floor. You want to see how they're doing when they're down 21. You want to see how they're doing on their bad days. You want to see how they're doing when they have four drop balls, high school football, a lot of drop balls. Do they, do they, uh, come back and, and stay true to themselves or do they cave to their circumstances? I think there's a lot of stuff that you're looking for in film, but I don't think any of it trumps how they're made, um, what they're made of. We'll go back to the stuff. Like, you know, we're going to identify kids that have unique stuff, uh, grit, determination, resilience, leadership qualities. I want to see them thrive off the field. I think the dual sport thing's really important. They don't have to be a dual sport athlete but they have to have a background of fitting another role in another sport. We don't want prima donna quarterbacks. We don't want entitlement. Um, we don't want the look at me approach. So, um, you know, again, there this is a big complicated formula here. Um, I'm trusting my own eye, uh, my own time with them. Uh, I'm pretty calm. We, we love the ones we have here. We got two in the portal this year, Jacob Zeno, Damon Stewart. We're here. Uh, we have two really good walk-ons um, players that we have a lot of hope for. So, you know, we like our group now, and then we're going to, again, we're going to try to uh, recruit better than who's on our roster. But again, they're going to have to fit into doing it. Um, this sounds lame, our way, but our way is really uh, be a team first guy, have the other stuff. Uh, we, we're pretty confident we can develop and nurture the traits that they have and, and bring out the best of them from a physical standpoint. 
Perfect. Yeah, we can put a cork in it, and that can, that can be uh, Trent Dilfer Elite Eleven podcast episode two when you guys get another month or two to, to fully bake and ideate on the all the ingredients that go into being a, a quarterback at UAB that you guys are going to pursue and recruit and and all that good stuff. Because yeah, you, you guys have so many great quarterback minds there, and um, really excited to <clears throat> see what you guys come up with and, and and tap back in on that and here in the near future. I would say this, Brian. You know, I, we we're talking to our quarterback. I was talking to our quarterbacks the other day, and. You know, it's a unique opportunity. I'd be shocked if the quarterback that plays here isn't an early round pick. You know, I, I literally would be shocked. Uh, we're going to develop them to play the professional game at a young age. So we're going to have the opportunity to develop future NFL players here, uh, much like the Alabama model. You know, what they did a great job of is not just recruit really good players, but develop them all equally. And you end up with three, four NFL guys on the roster at the same time. Uh, we feel like we can do that here. So I'll be shocked if the guy um, that is our starter isn't a guy that also has the opportunity to make generational wealth playing quarterback in the NFL. Love it. Love it. Um, Want to get to this, you know, because it's been a it's been a powerful piece of your program everywhere you've been. Elite 11, uh, Lipscomb Academy, investing into the community, investing into the people. So, you know, how's how's the city of Birmingham treated you so far? Um, and have you been able to, to sink your roots all in, in, into the local community and, and start you know, building those relationships that are going to be so valuable moving forward there at UAB? We have, and UAB's had a great uh, legacy of serving their community. The athletic department uh, really is very proactive in getting their student athletes out in the community. But you know, I want to pour some gasoline on that. So uh, Martin Luther King Day, we went to the first black high school in Birmingham, Parker High School. Uh, we took the entire team and all the staff. Uh, and we just told them, listen, we just want to serve you. You tell us what to do and tell us how long to be there. And uh, really one of their big needs that they had was kind of a cleanup, a general cleanup of their campus. Their kids had not taken great care of their campus, especially their athletic facilities. Uh, so we took an army, 140 something people in there and picked up trash and scraped gum off the track and cleaned classrooms and fixed chairs and, uh, you know, did all the little things um, to kind of just serve that, that school. Uh, and make a statement that we're here for the community. And uh, we've had, we're starting to develop some mentor teams. We're going to be very, very invested into children's hospitals. Um, pediatric cancer uh, is a, got a devastating thing that's going on right now. And, and Birmingham's Children's, which is a children's hospital here, does a great job in their pediatric cancer ward. Uh, so we're going to develop ki uh, mentoring ki uh, groups of kids that go in and um, spend time with these kids dealing with a great challenge in their life and their families and serving their families. So, uh, again, we're really trying to teach these kids that they all want to be first, right? They all want to be first. They want to be famous. They want to be successful. Really trying to tell them they got to learn first how to be last um, and be a servant first. And, uh, and it, I'd, you'd be blown away by how fired up they are. I'd say they've been as excited about getting getting their fingers dirty in the community and serving the people in need as much as they are getting better at running inside zone. What an amazing way to, to start off with the community there in Birmingham. And, and hopefully that just goes a long way to, to start building those relationships that are going to be so valuable for you guys, you know, both out in the community and with your players. Right. And, and, and uh, those guys hopefully already are getting the feeling that, that you guys' love and, and uh, affection for them is, is genuine and, and the, all the things you want to invest in them for those players is going to benefit them, you know, outside of just their, their next couple of years there at UAB, but through the rest of their life. Um, with that being said, want to transition. I know you got a tight schedule here and we appreciate your time, uh, but want to get to some quick fun hitting stuff here and, and uh, you know, get your thoughts on some, some topical things and, and all your history in football. So uh, I want to start off with this one. Um, You've, you've been to so many different events football-wise. Uh, your playing career uh, probably has seen as much quarterback play in the last you know, 30 or so years as anybody in, in, the, in, in North America. So uh, who's the best quarterback you've seen throw a football in person, the, the prettiest thrower of a football um, in all your years uh, being out and, and watching this great sport? Marino or Rodgers? What words do you live by down there as the head coach at UAB? Yeah, I, you know, I'm carrying over something from last year, but really respond and still to react instead of react. There's so many things you could react to with this job. I think every coach would tell you, uh, you wake up every morning with a task list of, you know, a couple hundred things. And instead of reacting to them, you really need to respond uh, in a positive way, in an impactful way. And, and then the other one for me is specifically earning these players' trust is serving them. Um, you know, I'm the first person here, putting in chairs and cleaning whiteboards and picking up trash and 
you know, helping answer their questions or, you know, dealing with life issues, but really want to come first off as a servant to them instead of their coach. And I figure if I earn that, that respect and, and enter with that posture, um, that I'll be a lot easier to trust when the hard coaching stuff has to happen later. Amazing. So Trent Dilfer has a free 20 minutes or half an hour right now as the head coach at UAB. You know, what's your hobby or what are you going to what are you going to pick up and try to get in as it relates to the something fun that you're going to do that's that's non related to football? Well, starting today, it's going to be working out. Uh, however, my wife and I are going to start playing golf. So we do have office hours. Now, I will say this. One of the nice things about college football opposed to high school football is that, you know, in high school, I had to be at the parents beck and call. So there really was never a time off. I had to create a rule where they couldn't text me after 8 p.m. And that didn't always happen. Uh, But, you know, we get out of here, you know, 536 in the off season. And once daylight savings comes, my wife and I are going to start playing nine holes of golf in the evenings and uh, just to get away from football and kind of recharge our batteries. Love it. What's your most important daily habit right now? Wow. Um. I have a few. I, I would say I, I need to wake up every single morning and have at least a half an hour quiet time. You know, the day gets very loud. Um, you're being pulled a lot of different directions and, and there's a lot of important as well as urgent needs from the people around you. I need 30 minutes to myself. There's a great book called Lead Yourself First uh, by Mike Irwin, a dear friend of both of ours. And uh, he talks about how to be a great leader, you got to lead yourself first. And a lot of that starts starts with solitude. And I've been waking up at five or five thirty and getting a good half an hour of solitude in each day to kind of, you know, just make sure that my soul and my mind and everything is right as I walk into the cauldron, which is the head football coach of a, a major college football program. Uh, what's your biggest football pet peeve? Pre-snap penalties, probably more than anything else. Oh yeah, they came in to play big in the Super Bowl for Philly late in the game there, right? Those pre-snap penalties are a killer. Um, who are two people that have had the most impact on your, on your football life? Professional. I would still say Joey, you know, Joey Roberts, who's a dear friend of both of ours. You know, he's becomes his voice of reason in my life. He, he's gone from like a son to a bro, you know, from like a son to a brother to now a peer. And, um, he holds me accountable in a lot of things in life that, you know, we all need that. Um, and then, you know, second would probably be my wife. She, she, she's gone from, you know, as you're raising kids, you're kind of partnering this, like you're in the midst of this right now. It's like, you're all right. It's divide and conquer or say, I got you on this, or I'm supporting you. Well, when your kids are at the house, they kind of become a more of a partner with your job because they're invested in your success. And she's a great test of um, where I'm at. You know, if, if she sees my mood changing, if she sees my habits changing, um, I've kind of given her the freedom, which she likes to kind of call me out on that stuff and hold me accountable to those, those things. So, um, she's done a great job, both at Lipscomb and now here, um, making sure that I'm, I'm being true to who I am and, and making sure I'm a man of my word and, and that I'm acting and not just talking about it. Love it. Two great people. Uh, last one, what, what teaching through your youth has stuck with you most through your life journey? Decision-making. Um, we get so caught up in the football skill part of it. Uh, it's still a game of decision-making, uh, and you have to train players, make great decisions on and off the field. That that's winning and losing football, uh, is the, the quality of decisions you're making on a snap to snap basis. All right, my man, that's a wrap. Um, appreciate you hopping on with us. I know your time is precious and, and wanted to get you in and out in the time we talked about, but, uh, before we jump, just wanted to, um, say thank you. Uh, for the last 12 years, you know, both both you and uh, off camera there, Joey Roberts, um, you guys have have invested so much of your own time and uh, energy and, and love into into growing this event with us and, and been such a huge part of it. Um, I wouldn't be sitting in the chair I am right now with 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 everything you, without everything you guys have done. And um, just wanted to share that we're truly appreciative. You know, you, you opened your family up to us. Your your daughters came and worked our events, the late nights in the hotels away from your family. Um, all the extra time you put in that you didn't have to do, um, you know, it, just all the love that you guys you guys brought to the event in Elite 11. It meant so much to us. And um, we're truly thankful for the experience. We're fired up uh, to see how it goes down there at UAB and uh, can't wait to get out there and check out the operation and hopefully get to a game and, um, you know, follow along with with everything you guys are doing down there. But um, so appreciative for the last last 12 years and um, excited for the next step in your journey. So thank you so much. 
I appreciate you, brother. Right back at you. None of this is possible without our time there. So you guys are the best. And I appreciate this. And uh, the relationship isn't over. We're just not going to see each other as much. 